Hello, it's Eric from Strong Medicine, and today's topic is GI bleeding. I'll start with defining some important terms related to the symptoms patients can experience as part of their GI bleed. First is hematemesis. This is vomiting blood, or a brownish-black, semi-granular substance, often described as being like coffee grounds, which is what blood looks like after sitting in the acidic environment of the stomach for a while. Hematochesia is the passage of visible bright red or maroon colored blood in the stool. You will occasionally encounter the acronym BRBPR, which stands for bright red blood per rectum, which can be thought of as an easier to spell near synonym for hematochesia. Melina is black, tarry, foul-smelling stool that is the consequence of stool containing digested blood. And last, the term occult bleeding refers to bleeding without the presence of symptoms. In other words, the blood loss is either so small or so gradual that the patient doesn't realize it because their stool hasn't visibly changed. The most obvious framework for GI bleed is one that is classified by organ systems, which are grouped as either upper GI bleeds involving the esophagus, stomach, or duodenum, or lower GI bleeds involving the jejunum and ileum, the colon, the rectum, and the anus. Etiologies of bleeding within the esophagus include esophagitis, which can be the result of fungal or viral infections, and poorly controlled gastroesophageal reflux disease. Bleeding can also be caused by something called a Mallory Weiss tear, which is a tear in the inner lining of the esophagus caused by vomiting or retching. Esophageal varices are dilated venous collaterals that connect the portal and systemic venous systems. This is seen most commonly in cirrhosis. And of course, esophageal cancer. Etiologies in the stomach include peptic ulcer disease, gastritis, a condition called portal hypertensive gastropathy, and gastric cancer. There are three primary vascular abnormalities in the stomach, gastric varices, a Dulafoy's lesion, which is a single tortuous arterial in the gastric mucosa that is histologically normal, but of an unusually large diameter, and which can spontaneously rupture, and gastric antral vascular ectasia, which is also known as the watermelon stomach due to its endoscopic appearance. In the duodenum, we have peptic ulcer disease there as well, duodenitis caused by either infectious or non-infectious pathology, or vascular lesions called angiodysplasia, which are focal collections of dilated, thin-walled veins that are separated from the lumen by endothelium alone. A common synonym for angiodysplasia is arterial venous malformation, or AVM. Moving to the lower GI tract, in the jejunum and ileum, bleeding can be from inflammatory bowel disease, but only Crohn's disease is found there. It can also be from enteroinvasive infections, such as some strains of E. coli, and angiodysplasia again. The small bowel is also where one can find a Meckel's diverticulum, which is the most common congenital defect of the GI tract, occurring in approximately 2% of the population. It's a small outpouching of the intestines caused by incomplete obliteration of the vitellin duct, also known as the umphalomesenteric duct, an embryological structure. The vast majority of Meckel's diverticula are asymptomatic, but when symptoms occur, they are often related to bleeding. I don't know of data for this, but in my personal experience, the jejunum and ileum are the overall least common locations of GI bleeds, though this observation may be confounded by the fact that bleeding in these locations is the most difficult to identify and localize. In the colon and rectum, bleeding can be from either ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, enteral invasive infections and angiodysplasia again. A particularly common cause of colonic bleeding is something called diverticulosis, a condition in which focal weakening of the colonic wall leads to small outpouches known as diverticuli. If they become infected, the condition is called diverticulitis, and when they bleed, it's just called a diverticular bleed. While diverticular bleeds and diverticulitis can occur in the same patient over time, they only rarely occur simultaneously, 
In the colon, there are also polyps and colon cancer, and ischemic colitis from either shock, an embolus, or atherosclerosis of the mesenteric vessels. The last location is the anus, where typical etiologies of bleeding include hemorrhoids and anal fissures. The most common causes of upper GI bleeding in the U.S. are esophagitis, peptic ulcer disease, and gastritis. The most common causes of lower GI bleeding in the U.S. are angiodysplasia of the colon, diverticulosis, and hemorrhoids. One last significant group of etiologies are those associated with cirrhosis and portal hypertension. This includes esophageal and gastric varices, portal hypertensive gastropathy, and gastric antral vascular ectasias. As with all medical issues, the evaluation of a GI bleed begins with the history. Characterize the bleeding as hematemesis versus hematochesia versus melana versus occult. Identify how long the bleeding has been occurring and whether it is episodic or continuous. What associated symptoms are there? For example, abdominal pain and or distension, changes in appetite, weight gain or weight loss, diarrhea or constipation, and fever. Is there a history of hematologic, GI, or oncologic disease? What is the patient's medication history? This obviously includes antithrombotic drugs, but also NSAIDs, which can cause gastritis and ulcers. And what is the patient's alcohol, smoking, and drug history? In particular, alcohol and smoking both increase the risk of various GI malignancies, and alcohol itself can lead to gastritis and even Mallory Weiss tears if the patient is frequently vomiting and retching related to their intoxication. Moving to the exam, Obviously take the vitals. What parts of the rest of the exam should you focus on? Well, a full abdominal and rectal exam is pretty obvious. One can consider something called a guaiac test if the presence of bleeding is in doubt. For example, a patient reports passing stool that sounds sort of like melana, but the patient has never seen melana before and the rectal exam in the ER is normal. What exactly is the guaiac test, you might be asking? Well, for those not familiar with it already, it's a bedside test that detects the presence of microscopic amounts of heme in the stool. It's performed by applying a small amount of stool to a standardized card to which a reagent is applied. The development of a blue color indicates heme. Stool guaiac tests in the emergency room have fallen out of favor and if a patient is reporting easily identified blood in the stool, it's totally unnecessary. Other parts of the indicated focus physical include a skin and extremity exam, looking for peripheral signs of chronic liver disease, as well as occasionally you might see signs of IBD or, or inflammatory bowel disease. And a lymph node exam if considering malignancy on the differential diagnosis. Key labs for any patient with a GI bleed, of course, include a CBC, as well as an INR, PTT, and liver function tests. One very important clinical pearl here is that patients with an acute bleed of any cause will not immediately see a drop in their hemoglobin and hematocrit. When we bleed, we don't bleed pure red blood cells. We bleed whole blood, of course, both cells and plasma. So the concentration of hemoglobin that doesn't immediately change until fluid moves into the vessels from other body compartments. I don't think there is a clear answer to the question as to how long this process takes, but at a minimum, a few hours, and it may even take as long as a day to reach a new steady state. So the hemoglobin level should not be used to assess the severity of an acute GI bleed. The vital signs and the patient's general appearance, they're much better indicators. Additional diagnostic tests to consider include a gastric lavage and EGD if an upper source is suspected. Let me talk about these tests for a moment because you may not be familiar with them. A gastric lavage consists of placing a flexible tube called a nasogastric tube into the nose and advancing down the pharynx through the esophagus and into the stomach. Modest quantities of water are then instilled through the tube and aspirate it back up for examination. Specifically, 
to assess if there's evidence of blood sitting in the stomach at this particular moment. And if so, what the nature of that blood looks like. Is it bright red or is it more like uh, the coffee grounds I mentioned before? As with the guaiac test, gastric lavage has also fallen out of favor a little bit in the ER. First, if the patient reports recent unequivocal hematemesis, lavage won't provide any additional diagnostic information. In the past, gastroenterologists also wanted the lavage performed because if aspirated fluid eventually clears, it implies the bleeding has stopped, whereas if it fails to clear, the bleeding is ongoing. This might impact how urgently the patient has a more definitive procedure, such as an EGD. But more recent evidence, which I wouldn't say definitively answers the question, is consistent with lavage not actually leading to better heart outcomes. It's still occasionally done, though. Now let's talk about a much more common procedure and important procedure, the EGD. An EGD is an endoscopic procedure where a thin, flexible camera is introduced into the patient's mouth and advanced downward through the GI tract, usually to the second or third portion of the duodenum. The acronym stands for esophagogastroduodenoscopy, and this is a typical view that you might see through an endoscope. Last, a colonoscopy is indicated if a lower GI source is suspected. A colonoscopy is analogous to an EGD, but the scope is introduced through the anus and advanced proximally, usually to either the cecum or the terminal ileum. Before going through the diagnostic algorithm for both upper and lower GI bleeds, I'm going to talk about how we can distinguish whether the bleeding is coming from an upper or lower source. Historically, the distinction between upper and lower bleeds was usually defined as above or below the ligament of trites, a distinction which I found to not be particularly helpful as an internist. A more practical and slightly different distinction is whether or not a conventional EGD can reach the bleeding source, the limit of which is usually the mid-duodenum. Either way, upper GI bleeds typically present with hematemesis and or melena, but they can present with hematochesia if the bleeding is very brisk. Lower GI bleeds typically present with hematochesia, but can present with melena if the source is the small intestines or ascending colon. Features which strongly support an upper GI source include a positive gastric lavage, meaning the presence of blood or coffee ground-like material, a BUN to creatinine ratio greater than 30 in US units, a feature which strongly supports a lower GI source is blood clots mixed in with a stool, while a feature which partially refutes a lower GI source is hemodynamic instability. This is because upper GI bleeds are typically more brisk and more likely to be life-threatening than lower GI bleeds. Finally, upper GI bleeds as a general group have a few notable risk factors, including cirrhosis, alcohol, NSAIDs, H. pylori infection, and a hiatal hernia. So now, on to the algorithms. I'm going to start with suspected upper GI bleeds. The first step is to determine if the patient is hemodynamically stable. If no, resuscitate them first and perform an emergent EGD as soon as hemodynamics are stable enough to survive the procedure. If they are hemodynamically stable up front, they still need an EGD, but not quite as emergently. Having said that, EGDs are most likely to identify a source of bleeding if the bleeding is ongoing. So all things being equal, it's better to do it sooner rather than later, typically within 24 hours. If the EGD identifies the source, great. Time to prescribe specific treatment. But what to do if an EGD fails to identify the source? You follow it with a colonoscopy. If this identifies the source, once again, you're done. If it doesn't, that is both the EGD and colonoscopy are non-diagnostic, this is a situation often referred to as, quote, obscure GI bleeding. There are two possibilities here. One, the lesion could have stopped bleeding and is small enough that it was missed during conventional endoscopy. Or two, the lesion is somewhere in the small bowel that conventional endoscopy can't reach. If you have reason to think the former, you could repeat the EGD and or colonoscopy, or you could just observe the patient closely and hope the bleeding doesn't recur. If you have reason to think the latter, that the bleeding is hidden somewhere in the small intestines, you have a number of choices. You could get a CT angiogram of the abdomen and pelvis, something called a push enteroscopy, which involves taking a specialized endoscope 
introduced through the mouth and advancing it much farther down the GI tract, a tagged RBC scan, which is a test performed by nuclear medicine in which a small amount of a patient's blood is removed, red blood cells are radio-labeled, and then returned to the circulation. Radiosensitive images are then taken to see if the bleeding can be localized to a quadrant of the abdomen. This fuzzy mess is the typical quality of the image that you get. The major disadvantages of the study is that it tells you nothing about the cause and can't even conclusively tell you which organ the blood is coming from. And the last option is a capsule endoscopy, in which the patient swallows a pill large enough to contain a camera, which takes pictures continuously as it passes through the GI tract and is eventually eliminated with the bowel movement. There is no one right answer as to which test is most appropriate here. If you Google algorithms for obscure GI bleeding, you'll find dozens of images, each of which provides a slightly different algorithm. There will also be a lot of institutional preferences depending on things such as endoscopic expertise by the GI department and how frequently the nuclear medicine department performs tagged RBC scans. Let's move on to discuss the workup of suspected lower GI bleeds. There will be a lot of parallels with one notable exception. If the patient is hemodynamically stable, then an urgent colonoscopy. Within 24 hours is a nice time frame, but unless the bleeding is ongoing and severe, that timing can usually be pushed out just a little bit if necessary. If the patient is not hemodynamically stable, they need to be resuscitated first, followed by an emergent EGD. Yes, you heard that right. Because unusually rapid upper GI bleeds can cause hematochesia and thus be mistaken for lower GI bleeds, and they are more likely to be life-threatening, starting first with an EGD is the more commonly advised strategy. If the source is identified, great, you're done. If not, then follow with whichever of the two basic endoscopic procedures the patient has not yet had. Source identified, awesome. Source not identified, we have obscured GI bleeding again and are back to the same long list of options we saw before. One final addition to this algorithm is that hemodynamically stable patients with a single self-limited episode of hematochesia and a negative initial colonoscopy can be observed closely without further testing. Key takeaway points for this topic. GI bleeds can present with hematemesis, melanoma, and or hematochesia. Although upper GI bleeds typically present with hematemesis and or melanoma, while lower GI bleeds typically present with hematochesia, this is not absolute. The most common etiologies of upper GI bleeds are peptic ulcer disease, gastritis, and esophagitis. The most common etiologies of lower GI bleeds are diverticulosis, angiodysplasia, and hemorrhoids. And last, endoscopy is the primary diagnostic modality for all GI bleeds. Thanks for watching.